I'm Tactical Pascal, welcome to the channel, I hope you're all safe and well. This video is on the truth behind an intercept. If you're new to the channel, a little bit of information about myself. I'm a retired GCI instructor, so fighter control instructor. I still teach it as a civilian. Nothing contained in this video is going to break any official secrets act. It's all open source material. Now, if you've watched any film, Hollywood would have you believe that fighter pilots do it all on their own. They get airborne, they find the bad guy, do all their pilot -y stuff, and go back and drink lots of beer and get on with Kelly McGillis. In truth, any intercept starts with the detection of a target, whether that's from an airborne platform like an E3 or an E2, or a ground-based radar, mobile or static. Once that threat is assessed, the aircraft are scrambled. The scramble message is passed from the command and control unit, and Maverick, on quick reaction alert, thunders off down the runway. Coletti Ops and QRA, this is the Overlord Master Controller for QRA Operations Launch, Enfield 1-1, Enfield 1-2, Vector 3-0-0, Climb Angels 2-5, Set Speed Decimal 8, Squawk 1-3-2-1, 1-3-2-2, Contact Overlord 2-6-4, Decimal 5-0-0, Scramble, 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 Acknowledge. Ups. Curie. His scramble time is determined by the assessment made by the command and control team based on the speed, type of threat and exactly where they want the intercept to take place. This process has been in place since World War II when the Spitfires and the Hurricanes of the Royal Air Force were scrambled to intercept German bombers crossing the channel. Pilots are brave, intelligent people, and they're like attack dogs. They are lethal and ruthless when they need to be, but importantly, they respond to words of command. They are given headings, levels, and vectors for the intercept, and they follow them as directed to ensure the aircraft is intercepted as quickly as possible. Their radar is much smaller than the ground-based ones, or indeed the ones in the E3 or the E2, so they have less situational awareness than the guys in the ground or the air do. So they're given directions to the target. This includes everything from altitude to climb to, headings to go onto, and the speed they need to maintain for endurance for replacement purposes later on in the mission. So once the aircraft's airborne and he's checked in with the fighter controller, he's gonna be given these headings for cutoff and turns through at the intercept until he's rolled out one to three miles behind their unsuspecting target. All of this can be done without the fighter ever having to turn on his radar, which is going to alert the enemy of their presence. Once the fighter has been successfully rolled in behind the target, he's going to be told to shadow, escort or engage, depending on the rules of engagement. If it does become a shooting match, this is where our attack dog is unleashed and the pilots earn their money with their aggression, intelligence and bravery. During this entire process, the command and control units are preparing replacements for the fighters, are launching tanker support and monitoring for more threats. The pilots who do this are exceptional, but they require support throughout the whole of the intercept. If you think of the pilots as the tip of the spear, then the command and control agencies are the people that are throwing that spear at the target. Mr. Crowbar, near us, officer, bar 34072, 22,000 pair, hot. I'd like to thank you all for watching the video. If you have any questions, please ask me in the comments below or come along to our Discord channel, which is linked in my YouTube, and I'll include a link in the description below. Thank you very much. If you like it, like and subscribe if you fancy, and hopefully I'll see you all in the air. Tactical Pascal, out!